Stand with me, please. Thank you, choir and musicians, psalmists, praisers for helping us to worship the Lord this morning. We're very happy that you've all come to worship with us today. If we have any visitors, we greet you. Thank you for coming. And we certainly greet those who are watching. We are live streaming and they are observing this and worshiping with us also by radio and any other type of device you might have. Thank you for joining us today. God has something in store for every one of us. There are no accidents. For those of you that don't yet know Jesus, you've been in a spirit-filled church this morning and what you feel is the Holy Spirit and He's talking to you. You know you're not living right. You know it. But God loves you. You know that lifestyle you've chosen is not right. You know that stuff you're drinking and smoking and shooting up, that's not right. You know it. But there is a God in heaven. He is as real as this and He's as real as I am standing here. And He is able to save anybody from anything at any time. <laughs> Several days ago in prayer, the Lord laid this message on my heart to prepare this church for tomorrow night. This is a preparatory message today. Tomorrow night will be our 14th prayer meeting, Monday night prayer meeting. I don't know about you, but I'm hearing of people being healed, saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit. Brother, I've, I'm hearing it. It's happening. But God has brought us to this place and wants me to give you this message to prepare you for what is going to happen tomorrow night. You've heard the term quite often, breakthrough. It's coming. Listen to me. I'm speaking prophetically. It will happen tomorrow night. If you'll heed this word, it will happen tomorrow night. Almighty God, I thank you from my depths. I thank you from the bottom of my heart that you have been so kind and merciful, gracious and good to have loved us and brought us to this place. <clears throat> Not this, just this geographical place, <clears throat> but this place spiritually. Oh, how you've followed us around and goaded us. You have gently persuaded us and we find ourselves today hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Praise God's name for that. And so I ask you now to open our understanding, prepare us for the great thing that you have in store. You've had this planned for a long, long time, even before the foundation of the world. I thank you today that in just days, those that we thought were in sin too deep, are coming out. We thought people were too bound up, too shackled. They're coming out. Thank you for that promise and this word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And we ought to shout amen. amen. Thank you for being seated. Now, again, I'm going to let you get settled. You have purses to fix and blankets and all kinds of stuff. I don't know what you're doing, but I can't start until I know I have everybody's attention. That's how imperative this is. So. When Jesus came up out of the River Jordan after having been baptized by John and after having received the Holy Spirit, he was then led by that same spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil 40 days and nights. 
And the Bible says in Mark that he was with the wild beasts. And having gone without food and drink for a month and ten days, at the very limit, the Bible says, angels ministered to him. Wow. Angels ministered to him. When you follow him through his ministry and you come to the close of that and he's about to go to the cross, he is in the garden of Gethsemane. And the weight, the burden, the passion was so great as he was about to take the sins of the world to the cross. The Bible said his sweat became as great drops of blood. Then it says... The angels came and strengthened him. The point is, even Jesus Christ needed help from heaven. The virgin born, spirit baptized, holy son of God in his earthly body had to have a touch from heaven. Angels were dispatched to come, minister to him, and strengthen him. So keep that in mind as I go to Acts chapter 5. As we go from last week's message, it's a continuation. I spoke on signs and wonders, miracles, healings, gifts. They ought to be operating in the church. If, if it isn't, the church is dead. And here's what we read. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. That means there was such a power and so many uh, supernatural things going on in the congregation that the city and the citizens admired them. They just, they just didn't want to join that church. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Multitudes of both men and women. So that, listen to this, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches. That at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Then the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go, stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. So when it's darkest and the enemy thinks he's got you incarcerated, an angel shows up and says, Let's go. They can't hold you back. They can't hold you down. They can't lock you in. Let's go. Now, I'm only giving you a small fraction of references to angels and their ministry in the Bible. But listen to these. Remember Elisha? Elisha the prophet, the great prophet of Israel. The king of Syria is coming to fight against Israel. And the Lord speaks to the man of God and tells him what the Syrians are going to do so then the prophet sends a messenger to the king and says, don't go there, the Syrians will be there. Don't do this, the Syrians will be there. And the Syrian king said, is there a traitor in my army? Tell me who it is. And one spoke up and said, it's not one of us. It's that prophet down there. That prophet in Israel. He tells the king what you say in the privacy of your bedroom. The king said, I'm... I'm done with that. 
Let's go find this guy. Where is he? They said, well, the last we heard, he was in Dothan. So the Syrian king got all of his chariots, all of his archers, all of his spearmen, horses, everything, a mighty army to go get one man. And the Bible says, at night, they surrounded the prophet. Can I just tell you that the devil thinks he's smart when he moves at night? Have you ever noticed that things kind of fall apart at night? Have you noticed that when you get weak and tired and it's almost time to go to bed, uh, the devil seems to wake up and try his best? Oh, don't be alarmed if everything happens at night because he's the prince of darkness and that's the only atmosphere he knows how to work in. So he's going to come at night. So when the prophet and his servant wake up, the next morning the servant goes out to get water and he sees as the sun comes up that the mountains are surrounding them and they are full of Syrian horses and chariots. He panics. He runs inside to the prophet and says, Alas, my Lord, what shall we do? Uh, Elijah said, Don't you worry about it. Lord, open his eyes that he may see that those who are for us far outnumber those who are against us. And so when the servant went back out, he still saw the enemy. He saw the problem, but behind them and bigger than they was a whole mountain full of chariots of fire. The angels of the Lord were encamping about those that fear the name of God. Hear me now. That scripture is real. It's vital. The angel of the Lord encamps around those that fear him. I'm telling you again, there are angels in this building right now. Ah, an angel came to church with Sandra and me this morning. Angels are in the children's building right now. Angels are out in the lobby right now. There's a couple sitting on the steps on both sides right now while they're up in the choir right now. You say, Pastor, that's crazy. And I know newcomers will say, the man's losing his mind. No, I got my mind. When I found Jesus, I got my mind. And I know what this book says. God's angels are stationed everywhere. They far outnumber the enemy against us. The Bible says there's 10,000 times, 10,000 and thousands of angels just waiting on God the Father to give them a mission to come down here and protect and lift up the saints of the Most High God. Yeah. Then there was Lot. He's in Sodom and Gomorrah. God's about to rain fire down on that city for its it's evil and it's deviant ways. But God sent two angels and said to Lot, you better get out of here. In fact, we're taking you out of here. We cannot destroy the city until God's people are out of it. Now there's a picture of the rapture of the church if I've ever seen one. And the Bible says that Lot went and told his daughters, we got to go. They believed him. He went and told his sons-in-law, we need to get out of here. Judgment's coming. And they laughed at him. They thought he was kidding. So the angel said, forget them. Get your wife. Get your two daughters. And the Bible says, while Lot lingered, the angels took them by the hand and led them out quickly. Quickly, He said, quickly, let's go. So angels were sent from God into a sinful place to extract them from that place before the judgment of God comes upon them. Who did it? Angels did it. How about Daniel in the lion's den? He's a just and good man, but he's been falsely accused and now... He's been sealed in a, a den of lions. And the next morning, the king comes down and says, Oh, Daniel, can the God that you serve continually deliver you? Listen, 
Daniel said, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel to lock up the mouths of the lions. Your servant is fine and may you live forever. Who did it? God sent an angel and locked the mouths of the lions. You remember the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, the beggar? The Bible says when the beggar died, when Lazarus died, angels came and carried him into paradise or into Abraham's bosom. Then you remember Paul in a storm on a ship. It was a violent storm. They were facing death. Paul comes up on the deck and he says, fellas, don't worry about it. This night an angel of the Lord stood beside me and told me that not one single life is going to be lost. So you see, throughout the scriptures, these angels, these mighty warriors, these messengers, these spirits, these flames of fire from heaven are constantly obeying the bidding of the Father on behalf of the children of God. Psalm 91 says, He will give His angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways and they will carry you in their hands. The Bible says. Did you hear me? He will give, he will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways and he will hold you up, bear you up by their hands. And then one of the most amazing passages to me of late in the Bible, uh, Matthew 18, chapter 10. You you just got to see this. (laughs) Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Now folks, hold on. He's not talking about little children only. Because in another passage, he said to a whole group of grown men and women as well, Fear not, little flock, for it is the Father's good pleasure to give the kingdom to you. So when he says little children, little flock, he's not talking about toddlers. He's talking about the children of the Most High God. And so he said, I'm about to get happy here. Take heed that you don't despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Get a picture of this. In heaven. You see, everybody has an angel. Every child of God has, is in protective custody. He has an escort. Hallelujah. He has someone who's watching over them. I've got at least one angel. We all have at least one. Some of us need many more than one to watch out over us all of the time. But, but Jesus said, watch this. In heaven, my angel, your angel, their angel is always staring at Glaring at my Father's face in heaven. They don't flinch till he moves. They're not watching other angels. They're not listening to angelic choirs. They're not watching the activity of other heavenly beings. They are staring in the face of the heavenly Father. Now, please, just let me, this is the the way I understand it. I am a dog lover. I love dogs. I think they are from heaven. And I think that one of the cutest things in the world, and I did it to all our dogs, when I got up at a certain time of the day and headed toward the cabinet, she knew it could be treat time right here. (laughs) Have you ever noticed that when you start rattling a bag, you get into their treats, they'll sit there, their ears are perked, They're poised. They're not looking around the room. They're looking at you. In fact, they're looking into your eyes. You can flinch and they'll look at you like this. You can act like you're going towards the bag and they'll, you want a treat? Oh, that's all it takes. And without demeaning this precious truth of the Holy Scripture, 
That's exactly what it's like for angels because the only one they listen to, the only one they care about is the Father sitting on the throne. They were created by Him for His pleasure and to do His bidding. And He assigned them to those who are coming to heaven one of these days. And they're just waiting on the Father to look in their direction or nod down there or point down here or say, hey, there's some apostles in jail down there. There's a Peter in jail down there. There's a Paul on a ship down there. There's a Daniel in a lion's den down there. There's a lot in Sodom. Go get them out. Go get them. And the angels of the Lord show up and deliver those. Acts chapter 12 goes something like this. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James the brother of John with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread, so when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Wow. Constant means fervent, unceasing, hot, intentional prayer. And it wasn't offered by Peter's wife. It wasn't offered by his fellow apostles or friends. It was offered by the church. The church came together and in one accord with fervent prayer began to pray for that situation. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping bound <clears throat> with two chains between two soldiers. And the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him he didn't go through the gate. He just stood by him. And a light shone in the prison. He didn't find a torch. He just showed up and light filled up the prison. The guards didn't see it. The guards didn't know it. Only the redeemed of the Lord could see that light. And he struck Peter on the side. Now, why did he have to strike him? He hit him. He assaulted him on the side and raised him up saying, Arise quickly. Can I tell you one more time? Angels never say, Take your time. Slow down. Chill. It's all under control. Get a hold of yourself. No. Every time the Father sends one to a situation, the angel says, Get up. Get out. Quickly, move. And just to make sure he did, he slapped him in the side. It must have been a stunning thing for Peter to wake up with an angel standing there. And he says, get up. And it's, the room is full of light. Get up, get up. And suddenly as he tried to get up, chains fell off his hand. <laughs> then the angel said to him, gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. <laughs> well, when they were past the first and the second guard post, <laughs> and nobody saw them, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. You didn't need to press any buttons. There was no code. 
The angel said, let's go. Peter's still dressing and trying to tie up his sandals and get together. And they go past the first door and the guard doesn't see them. They go past the second door and the guard doesn't see them. They get outside and that big iron gate just opens up. Peter said, this has got to be a vision. <laughs> but now I know, as the angel departed, now I know that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. And when she recognized Peter's voice because of her gladness, she did not open the gate but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, you're beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it's his angel. Even they knew that everybody has an angel. Now Peter continued knocking and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. I got all kinds of questions here. I had him at the first service too. This is not rehearsed stuff. They prayed. They prayed fervently. But they didn't really believe it was going to happen. Had they believed it, they would have believed Rhoda when she said he's out there. But they were praying, crying out to God, but not expecting an answer from God. I think that's the condition of the church today. We can fill up buildings and pray long, hard, and loud. But if we don't believe that what we ask for will come to pass, what good is it? If we don't believe that what we petition God for is coming our way. What good is all this? We are wasting our time. I don't want to just have a big crowd at prayer meeting and throw up some requests and petitions to God and then go out and keep worrying about something and trying to you know, customize the situation. No, sir. I want to come and let God know the desires of my heart and then when I close my mouth, believe that it's done and go my way rejoicing. So here's what I heard the other day. It's been really hot out in Nebraska, as you know. It's been really dry. There's a part of Nebraska, they're one of those small farm towns. It hadn't rained in weeks and weeks. The farmers lost their crops. And that's their main income. Uh, the business is dying. There are no flowers around the houses. They're worried about drinking water. Dusty, dry, powdery. And one day in the pulpit, the local pastor said, I feel like this afternoon at 4 o'clock, we need to have a citywide prayer meeting. Come out to this dry field out here beside the church. Somebody call the mayor. Call your friends. Let's have a prayer meeting in this dusty field and ask God to send rain. Four o'clock rolls around. A good number of people are there. The mayor is present. Church members are there. It's so dusty. And, and their feet have created clouds of dust. And with their perspiration, they're covered in mud and dust. They're about to pray when one of the old saints in that church, an old lady, Sister Jones, comes driving up in her old car and she interrupts everything and they turn around and they, they see it's Sister Jones, but they notice something strange when she opened the door and threw her legs out. She had on galoshes. Anybody want to help me preach right now? Or do I need any help right now? And then she got up and then noticed she had on a raincoat. <clears throat> and then when she closed the door, she held up her umbrella. And she walked up to the crowd and the pastor said, well, Sister Jones, what's wrong with you? Don't you see that it's dry as a powder keg out here? There ain't no rain, ain't no water. What, you, what are you doing with galoshes, raincoat, and an umbrella? 
She said, I thought you said that we were going to ask God for rain today. So I figured I better get ready for a rain shower. Now that might be a funny little story to some of you, but that's a fact, brother. How many times we pray, but we don't really believe it. I want to ask some of you who are in desperate and dire need today. When we meet tomorrow night to pray, are you going to bring an umbrella? Will you put on your galoshes? And I don't mean really. Some of you will do that. I know you. I am not asking literally for you to wear a raincoat to church. I'm asking you by faith. Can you walk in here and say, what we believe will come to pass in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. This is it, brother. This is why I've been at this church going on 43, plus 43 years now. This is it. All these years are coming down to this right here where we see a supernatural, miraculous move of Almighty God where the miracles are going to happen in such rapid succession that we can't count them and nobody knows how to explain it. There are... Ah! Excuse me. Thank you, Jesus. See, I'm still apologizing. I don't care what you think about me. See, there, there are people in here right now you are hungry and you are desperate, but you just haven't seen any results in so long. And it looks like the harder you pray, the worse it gets. Let me tell you about a man named Elijah. There hadn't been rain for three and a half years. And Elijah said to his servant, I'm going to kneel down right here and start praying for rain. You go over the mountain and tell me if you see anything. Come back now, hurry up. And the little servant came back and said, not a cloud in the sky. He said, go back again. And he started praying again. He came back, nothing, three times. Go! Came back, nothing. Seven times. He sent that servant out over the hill to see if there was any sign of rain. Each time the report was bad, Elijah got back down on his face and began to cry out to God for rain. But on the seventh time, he said, what did you see? The servant said, well, I, I see the, a cloud about the size of a man's hand. And Elijah said, that's all I need to know. And let me explain something to you. You can pray time and time and time again and see nothing. That just means go back to praying about it. Never quit praying. Pray without ceasing. Pray everywhere, holding up holy hands without wrath and believing that God is able. And then when you do see a little tiny sign, that doesn't mean quit. That doesn't mean it's over. It means go down again. Keep praying until you hear a thunderclap. Keep praying until you see rain splashing all around you. Never give up because God is faithful. So, as I was praying, meditating on that passage where Peter was in prison, in my spirit, I saw the cell. I saw the darkness of it. I saw two guards, two enemies of righteousness chained to this person. But that person wasn't Peter. It was your son. It was your wayward daughter. It was your backslidden husband. It was a family member that used to be on fire for God who now cares nothing 
for the church, for the Bible. It was people you loved dearly who through the process of life, spiritual warfare, interaction with the world have found themselves tangled up. You know, believers can be overtaken in a fault, Galatians 6 says. Overwhelmed, overtaken. Believers can get tangled up with substance abuse. Believers can fall into an, an adultery trap. And the list of sins goes on and on. It can happen. Children who were dedicated to God, even on this stage, by me, by Pastor Baker, have chosen alternate lifestyles. Nobody, I can't figure that out. But that's your child. That's your relative lying there in the darkness of a devil's holding cell chained between two demons with other demons standing at the door making sure he doesn't get out. And I hear the devil cackling, laughing, saying, we're going to keep this one because his parents are in the ministry and it keeps them upset and it breaks their heart and they can't be truly effective. And we're going to keep her because it keeps her mother so distraught. Those parents are torn up all the time. No, these are our prizes. These were ones he thought he had, but we got them now. Hang on to them. Don't let them go. And God said, tomorrow night, not today, tomorrow night, we are going to turn towards the Father and say, Father, would you send an angel, a ministering spirit, to show up in the emptiness and darkness of my son's life. Would you go and get my daughter out of that horrible addiction, that weakness? You see, those chains represent something. Addiction. I talk about it all the time because every week I hear about another child of yours or somebody in this church who has fallen into an addiction. Lying between two devils. They've given up. They tried to break it. They tried to overcome it. They haven't and they've just kind of gone to sleep between two devils. We ask the Father, we will ask the Father to send angels to help that young man or woman get their sanity back about their sexual orientation. And that angel is able to make those chains fall off. Mental problems chained up in the darkness between demons wrestling with suicide, rejection, horrible anger that makes them unqualified to even be sociable, to hold down a job, to be kind and speak good words. Chained. The writer of Hebrews says, what is an angel? It's a ministering spirit. Listen, sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. 
Go back to that passage in Matthew where Jesus talked about the little ones and their angels beholding his face. Two verses down it says, For it is not my Father's will that any one of these should perish. The God we serve is greater than any foe. And we're going to pray, God, whatever you have to do to get my boy out of Sodom, do it. If you have to grab him and jerk a knot in him and drag him out, do it. Whatever you have to do to get my daughter out of that place, that crack house. Lord, if you have to lasso her, grab her by the neck through an angel, do it, Lord Jesus. Because we believe that if you promised that they can be saved and serve the Lord, then it must come to pass. And here's what I'm going to say before tomorrow night. I believe that some of your children that you've just, you just kind of hope they make it to heaven are going to end up singing the praises of God, teaching the truth of God, preaching, living right, telling the truth about everything, not being ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, having a boldness in their faith. No, you can't make me doubt what I'm telling you right now. I saw it in the spirit. I saw an angel walk in and break the chains off your baby. And that baby got up and walked out. Stand with me, please. Stand with me, please. I saw it. I saw it. And I believe it. Quickly move, would you? Fill up this area here, the aisles. I don't care where you are. Move in one direction or another. If it's only four feet, just move. But you cannot afford to come here tomorrow night with question marks. That's why the Lord wants me to give you more than 24 hours to pre prepare for this. Listen, can you hear me? You need to be, I know you have to go to work. But you can find some time before tomorrow night where you can read God's word and pray fall down before him and believe that what he said is going to come to pass. Yes. To prepare your heart to come in here and be done with reservations and questions and theological mumbo jumbo and just come to a mighty heavenly father that's just waiting on us to pray yes. so he can send forth yes. a mighty angel in behalf of those who will inherit salvation. Did this make sense to anybody this morning? Did it? I'm walking in this building tomorrow night believing that testimonies like popcorn are going to start coming back. Pastor, I never thought my child would call me and say, can I come talk? That's what I'm believing to hear. Pastor, I never believed that she would leave him or he'd get away from that, but it's gonna happen. Pastor, my husband all of a sudden wants to go back to church with me. Oh, yes, yes. Anybody feel anything now? I mean, like right now. Well, think what's gonna happen as we take more than 24 hours to re read and pray and build ourselves up and come into this place and offer a mighty assault to the throne room of God in faith. Lift your hands with me and say, prepare my heart, O oh God, for what you are about to do. Jesus' mighty name. Sing it. Hallelujah. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Oh, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Oh, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. 
This is how I find my bad. That's how you do it. This is how I find my bad. 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 Oh yes, Jesus. This is how I find my bad. Monday nights ago. Rob, where were you guys? Where was your son sitting? Over here? Yes. And then the little Millard girl, where, where do you think she was sitting? I'm sorry? Over here? Up top. These are children. Rob's son punched his mother and said, Mom, look. And his mom was trying to pray. Shh, Mom, look. What? Look! Angels! And he said, right up there, in those three boxes, there were two in the middle one and one on each side. And one, and he described it intricately. Uh, intricately. Kids can't make this stuff up. Length of hair, what they were wearing, the one in the middle had two purple stripes down his robe. And one had a trumpet holding it out like this, moving the valves a little bit. But what they didn't know was that the other child saw the same thing. Two children. And described it in detail to her parents, the same thing. Except that in her vision, two of the angels came down while we were kneeling around the altar and they put their hands up over us like this. Yeah. Folks, this ain't religion. <clears throat> this is spiritual. We walk in the spirit. We see in the spirit. We walk by faith and not by sight. They're here. They're here right now. I tell you, one followed me across this stage as I was preaching to you this morning. And one will follow you home, brother. Are you a child of God, an heir of salvation? He'll get in the back seat. Thank you, Jesus. They're not afraid of traffic either. They can stand out in front of a truck and keep it from hitting you. They're not afraid of muggers and robbers either. They can stand between them and you. They're not afraid of anything. They are messengers of God sent forth from God to take care of those who belong to God. This great loving God cares about us more than we can know. So here we are. Jesus might come. I don't know. Jesus said only the Father knows. So I can't say when Jesus is coming, but I know this. If he doesn't come, tomorrow night I'm going to dance my way into this sanctuary. And I'm going to shout and rejoice and bless God for all of your answered prayers and for all of the salvations and for all of the infillings of the Holy Spirit. And people are going to get healed in their stomach, in their lungs, in their head, in their heart. It's going to happen. So now, Lord, we depart this place knowing that when we gather again, you're going to show yourself mighty. 
Let the words of my mouth of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength, my redeemer. Amen. And the whole church shouted, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Bless you. Let us bless the